Sutra. Ananda, consider, for example, a person who inhales deeply through his nose. After he has inhaled for a long time, it becomes fatigued, and then there is a sensation of cold in the nose. Because of that sensation, there are the distinctions of penetration and obstruction, of emptiness and actuality, and so forth, including all fragrant and stinking vapors. However, both the nose and the fatigue originate in body. Overexertion will produce the characteristic of fatigue. Commentary: The eyes and ears have already been explained above. Now is the nose entrance which will be discussed. Ananda, Shakyamuni Buddha calls Ananda's name in order to cause him to be particularly attentive. You should listen well so the doctrines are explained for you. Consider, for example, a person suppose there was such a one. What does this person do? He hasn't anything to do, so he plays a joke on himself. How? He inhales deeply through his nose. He keeps a sniffing in. He inhales sharply. Now, usually we make use of our sense of smell when there is something to smell, but this person inhales deeply through his nose, and not only does he do it deeply, he does it for a long time. After he has inhaled for a long time, it becomes fatigued. If you breathe in for a long time, you will feel tired. The nose will get tired, and when it gets tired, false thinking arises. The nose gives rise to false thinking. What kind of false thinking? Probably it thinks rest, rest, but the person, the person does not let it rest, and so then it has a sensation. What sensation? Then there is a sensation of cold in the nose. The breath it takes in, it takes in, feels cold, extremely icy. Because of that sensation, there are the distinctions made. In the midst of that icy breath, it gives rise to discriminations concerning the sensation of the breath entering the nostrils. What distinctions does it make? Penetration and obstruction. Ah, my nostrils are stopped up, or I can breathe through my right nostril but not through my left one. He starts making distinctions. Not having anything to do, he finds something to do, producing all those discriminations, emptiness and actuality. Emptiness refers to penetration, and actuality refers to obstruction. He thinks, ah. Do I have a cold now? Since I can't breathe through my nose, he makes these kinds of distinctions, and so forth, including all fragrant and stinking vapors. What is meant by stinking? The Chinese character xiao to stink is a combination of the character zi self and the character da great. So stinking is explained as in great self. To look upon oneself as a, as very great is what is meant by stinking. So it is that a great self stinks. Some people don't know what fragrant and stinking vapors refers to. I'll tell you. Take a fish, set it down somewhere, and pay no further attention to it. After a while, it will stink, and when it begins to stink, it will produce worms. Basically, fish are eatable, but once there are worms in them, you don't want to eat them. Now, to speak of eating them, all you have to do is think about what they would smell like, and that is enough to make you want to vomit. Just as when someone speaks of sour plums, your mouth waters, or when you think about standing on the rim of a ten thousand foot precipice, your legs grow weak and the soles of your feet begin to ache. It's the same principle. If you think about stinking things, you want to vomit. It's very strange. People from Shanghai only like to eat things that stink. They like to eat bean curd that smells like excrement from a toilet. Wouldn't you say that is strange? I'm not slandering people from Shanghai. That's really the way they are. Then again, when I went to Pu Tong Mountain. To Fa Yo Monastery and Pu Ti Monastery, the people native to these areas ate nothing but stinking sugarcane, 
Basically, sugar cane is for making sugar, and I don't know what they did to it, but it's thank to high heaven. Basically, I'm not too choosy about what I eat. I eat the good and bad alike. When it comes to food, I don't make use of the consciousness of the mind, which makes distinctions. But that sugar cane stank so badly it was not easy to eat. The people of that area could not get along about without eating it though. That's an example of to each his own. They like to eat that stinking sugar cane, and if you didn't give it to them to eat, they thought you were mistreating them. And so it is in this world. There are many kinds of things to eat, and people like to eat things with different tastes. People's natures are different every single place you go. You don't have to pay any attention to whether things sting as long as you don't have a great self. Looking upon oneself as very great is stinking. It is more stinking than stinking fish and stinking excrement. No one dares get near you. Why? It is not because you are great. It is because you have turned into something stinking. Sutra, because the sense of smelling is stimulated in the midst of the two forms, defiling objects of penetration and obstruction, defiling appearances are taken in. This is called the nature of smelling. Apart from the two defiling objects of penetration and obstruction, this smelling is ultimately without the substance. Commentary, because the sense of smelling is stimulated in the midst of the two forms, defiling objects of penetration and obstruction, the defiling objects of penetration and obstruction, those unclean things become manifest and within them arises a smell nature. The Chinese character one can mean both to hear and to smell. Here it does not refer to hearing but rather to the smelling nature. Defiling appearances are taken in. Because the smelling nature inhales the two defiling appearances of penetration and obstruction, this is called the nature of smelling. Once again, the smelling nature, one thing, does not refer to the hearing nature, also one thing, which returns to the returns the hearing to hear the self nature. It is not what Kuan Yin Bodhisattva refers to when he says, to returning the hearing to hear the self nature, which I practiced to accomplishment of the unsurpassed way. He listened to his own self nature and practiced to accomplishment the unsurpassed way. He obtained the perfect penetration of the ear organ. The text here, though, refers to the ability to smell. Apart from the two defining objects of penetration and obstruction, this smelling is ultimately without a substance. Apart from the two defining states of penetration and obstruction, apart from these two defining objects before one, smelling basically has no substantial nature. Sutra, you should know that smelling does not come from penetration and obstruction, nor does it come forth from the sense organ, nor is it produced from emptiness. Commentary, this is the same as the doctrine explained above. You should know, Ananda, that smelling, the smelling nature, that does not come from penetration and obstruction. It is not from penetration and obstruction that the smelling nature comes into being, nor does it come forth from the sense organ, nor is it that the nose produces the smelling nature, nor is it produced from emptiness. Where does it come from? Sutra, why? If it came from penetration, the smelling would be extinguished when there is obstruction, and then how could it experience obstruction if it existed because of obstruction? Then, where there is penetration, there would be no smelling. In that case, how would the awareness of fragrance, stench, and other such sensations come into being? Commentary. Why? What doctrine leads me to say that it does not come from penetration and obstruction, nor from the sense organ, nor from emptiness, I will explain it to you. Listen, 
If it came from penetration, the smelling would be extinguished when there is obstruction. Penetration and obstruction are direct opposites, and so if the nature of smelling came from penetration, obstruction would not have a smelling nature. The nature that smells obstructions would be extinguished. And then, how could it experience obstruction if the nature that smells obstructions were absent? How would you be able to know there are obstructions if it exists because of obstruction? If the smelling nature existed because of obstructions, then where there is penetration, there would be no smelling. You would not be able to smell with the smelling nature. How is it that you could perceive penetration and could perceive obstruction? Therefore, it does not come from penetration and it does not come from obstruction. You should understand the nature of smelling. In that case, how would the awareness of fragrance, stench, and other such sensations come into being? Since it is neither penetrations nor obstructions, how do the sensations of fragrance and stench come into being? Sutra, suppose it came from the sense organ, which is obviously devoid of penetration and obstruction. A nature of smelling such as this would have no self-nature. Commentary, suppose it came from the sense organ, if it were produced from the nose, which is obviously devoid of penetration and obstruction, it hasn't any connection with penetration and obstruction. A nature of smelling such as this would have no self-nature. However, you explain it, it hasn't any self-nature either. Sutra, suppose it came from Antony's smelling itself would turn around and smell your nose. Moreover, if it were emptiness itself which smelled, that connection would, what connection would it have with your engines? Commentary. Suppose it came from emptiness. If the smelling nature came forth from emptiness, smelling itself would turn around and smell your nose. It should first smell your nose. Moreover, if it were emptiness itself which smelled, what connection would it have with your engines? Moreover, there's another way to explain it. Let's just suppose that the smelling nature did come from emptiness. Then, what connection would it have with your nose engines? Think it over. Is there any such principle? Sutra, therefore, you should know that the nose engines is empty and false since it neither depends upon causes and conditions for existence nor is spontaneous in nature. Commentary, therefore, you should know. You ought to know the reason behind this doctrine is that the nose engines is empty and false. The nose organ, along with the smelling nature which is produced in it, is also empty, false, and unreal, since it neither depends upon causes and conditions for existence, nor is spontaneous in nature. As to its origin, it is not counted as a drama produced from causes and conditions nor is its origin a spontaneous coming into being. Ultimately, where does it come from? Have I not already explained it above? The five skandhas, the six entrances, the twelve places, and the eighteen realms, all these functions and awareness do not go beyond the wonderful nature of true suchness of the Thuskama's treasury. They are all produced from the wonderful nature of true suchness of the first common's treasury. Because of the first ignorant thought, all kinds of false views and false characteristics arise. The division into seeing and characteristic arises. Seeing is the ability to perceive. Characteristics refers to things with form and appearance which are perceived. They are all created from the ignorant thought of the false thinking mind. Sutra, Ananda, consider for example, a person who licks his lips with his tongue, his excessive licking causes fatigue. If the person is sick, there will be a bitter flavor. A person who is not sick will have a subtle sweet sensation. Sweetness and bitterness demonstrate the tongue sense of taste. 
when the organ is inactive, a sense of tastelessness prevails. However, both the tongue and the fatigue originate in body. Stress produces the characteristic of fatigue. Commentary Before you heard the sutra, you got to gather with your eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind every day. But in all that time, you never knew where they came from. Who would have quest that there were so many things in the treasury of the third come one? How big is the treasury of the third come one? Anyway, that it is able to contain so many things. The treasury of the third come one is bigger than anything else, and so it can contain everything. If it were not bigger than anything else, then it would never be able to contain so many things. Where does it put so many things? Divide it up into categories. You have your own eye entrance, and other people have their own eye entrances. You have your ear entrance, and other people have their ear entrances. You have your nose entrance, others have their nose entrances. You have your tongue entrance, and they have their tongue entrances. If they were all just jumbled up together, when it came time to use them, how would you be able to if they were not simply lumped together but were divided so that each person's entrances were in an individual place, there would have to be a lot of places. It would have to be a big space. That's why I say that the treasury of the first common is bigger than anything else and can contain everything. There is nothing it does not contain. Where are we now? We are in... We are all in the treasury of the first common. We haven't seen what the treasury of the first come one looks like, you say. You see it every day, but you don't recognize it. In all your daily activities, you are within the treasury of the first come one. What your eyes see, what your ears hear, absolutely everything is within the treasury of the first come one. Yet you don't know what the treasury of the first come one looks like. In China, there is the saying, I can't tell what Lu Mountain really looks like because I myself am standing on Lu Mountain. Why can't you tell what Lu Mountain looks like? Because you are on the mountain itself, and so you cannot see it in its entirety. Those of you who understand now know that everything is a manifestation of the treasury of the first common. Those who don't understand the Buddha Dharma don't even know what is meant by the treasury of the first common. Such people stand at the Buddha. How? They say, all Buddhism talks about all the treasury of the first common. The treasury of the first common and how it contains everything. The Buddha's greed is greater than anyone else. He stores away absolutely everything. But this is a mistake. The treasury of the first common is not the Buddha's. Everyone has a share in it, so that kind of view is a mistake. Ananda, consider, for example, a person who licks his lips with his tongue, uses his tongue to lick his own lips. I'll tell you something funny. More than likely, that man didn't have a girlfriend, so he took to kissing himself. Do you believe that? It's true. His excessive licking causes fatigue. He doesn't just lick them once and let it go at that. He continually licks his lips. He licks himself for a long time and then gets tired. If the person is sick, if the person who is licking his lips is sick, there will be a bitter flavor. After licking for a long time, he will be aware of a very bitter flavor. What kind of sickness does this sick person have? Perhaps his love sick. That is, he's thinking about women. So he licks his own lips for a long time and is aware of bitterness. He feels, ah, this isn't flavorful. It's not very interesting. Do you notice when, how, when I speak Buddha Dharma, nobody seems to understand very well, but as soon as I begin to explain such matters as this, everyone understands. A person who is not sick will have a subtle sweet sensation. Someone who is not sick will have ever so slight a sensation of sweetness. Sweetness and bitterness demonstrate the tongue sense of, state, of taste. 
Because of these two flavors, the organ of the tongue manifests. Then the function of the tongue can appear. When the organ is inactive, a sense of tastelessness prevails. When the tongue is not in motion, tastelessness constantly prevails in the tongue. Tastelessness means no flavor whatsoever. However, both the tongue and the fatigue come together. They originate in body. Why does the tongue get fatigued in that way? Stress produces the characteristic of fatigue. It occurs when, in the true nature of body, a falseness arises, and prolongation produces the characteristic of fatigue. Sutra, because of two defining objects of sweetness and bitterness, as well as the tastelessness, stimulate a recognition of taste which in turn draws in these defining sensations. It becomes what is known as a sense of, of taste. Apart from the two defining objects of sweetness and bitterness, and apart from tastelessness, the sense of taste is originally without a substance. Commentary: Because the two defining objects of sweetness and bitterness, as well as tastelessness, stimulate a recognition of taste, which in turn draws in these defining sensations, it becomes what is known as a sense of taste. The word tastelessness. Appears here, but you can say that it doesn't count as a flavor. So the text merely says to false defiling objects. Plain cabbage boiled in plain water is tasteless and hasn't any flavor. If one doesn't add any salt or any oil, but just cooks the cabbage in plain water, it will be tasteless. Within bitterness and sweetness. A kind of awareness arises and takes in the two appearances. Apart from the two defining objects of sweetness and bitterness, and apart from tastelessness, the sense of taste is originally without a substance. Although tastelessness basically lacks flavor, it gives rise to sweetness and bitterness, and so you could say that tastelessness is the sweet and is the bitter, and that is why the taste prefers the two. Two kinds of defining objects, apart from them, taste has no substantial nature of its own. Sutra, thus, Ananda, you should know that the perception of sweetness, bitterness, and tastelessness does not come from sweetness or bitterness, nor does it exist because of tastelessness, nor does it arise from the sense organ, nor is it produced from emptiness. Commentary. This is the same principle as was stated above. Thus, Ananda, you should know that the perception, the testing that was explained above of sweetness, bitterness, and tastelessness, when you own your own tongue recognizes the flavor of bitterness and of tastelessness, does not come from sweetness or bitterness. It is not from the flavors of bitterness and sweetness. That the recognition arises, nor does it exist because of tastelessness, nor is it because of tastelessness that there is that kind of recognition, nor does it arise from the sense organ. It is also not produced from the tongue, nor is it produced from emptiness. Sutra. For what reason? If it came from sweetness and bitterness, it would cease to exist when tastelessness was experienced. So how could it recognize tastelessness? If it arose from tastelessness, it would vanish when the flavor of sweetness was tasted. So how could it perceive the two flavors, sweet and bitter? Commentary: Why, if it came from sweetness and bitterness, if the nature which recognizes taste came from sweetness and bitterness, it would cease to exist when tastelessness was experienced. There would be no recognition of tastelessness. So how could it recognize tastelessness? Then how would one know the flavor of tastelessness if it arose from tastelessness? If the taste recognizing nature arose from tastelessness, it would vanish when the flavor of sweetness was tasted. The nature that recognizes sweetness would disappear. So how could it perceive the two flavors, sweet and bitter? If in fact 
there was no recognition of sweetness. How could he steal? No other two characteristics of sweetness and bitterness. Sutra. Suppose it came from the tongue which is obviously devoid of the defiling objects of sweetness and bitterness and of tastelessness, an essence of tasting such as this would have no self nature. Commentary. Suppose it came from the tongue which is obviously devoid of the defiling objects of sweetness and bitterness and of tastelessness. If it came from the tongue, there would not be the flavors of sweetness and tastelessness and bitterness. Why not? The tongue itself doesn't have a flavor of sweetness or tastelessness or of bitterness. An essence of tasting such as this would have no self-nature. The taste recognizing nature would not have a self-nature. Sutra, suppose it came from emptiness. The sense of taste would be experienced by emptiness instead of by the mouth. Suppose, moreover, that it was emptiness itself which tasted. What connection would that have the intro engines? Commentary. Suppose it came from emptiness. If the taste recognizing nature came from within emptiness, the sense of taste would be experienced by emptiness instead of by the mouth. Emptiness would naturally know what it tastes. How would you know if the taste recognizing nature tastes? were to come from emptiness. Emptiness itself would recognize them, and your mouth would not be able to recognize them. Suppose, moreover, that it was emptiness itself which test. If emptiness itself knew of this test recognizing nature, what connection would that have with your engines? It wouldn't have any connection with your tongue engines. Sutra, therefore, you should know that The tongue entrance is empty and false since it neither depends upon causes and conditions for existence nor is it spontaneous in nature. Commentary, therefore, because of that you should know, Ananda. Don't continue to be so confused. Don't continue to be so stupid. Don't continue to be so unclear. You ought to know that the tongue entrance is empty and false. It is an empty falseness. It is not counted as causes and conditions. It neither depends upon causes and conditions for resistance, nor is it spontaneous in nature. It too is produced from within the true nature of body, the wonderful nature of true suchness of the first common treasury.